jurisdictions of the respondents. The court ordered the respondents to file separate addresses on their objections along with their final addresses. Proof of their petition. The petition has called 13 witnesses who gave evidence as PW1 to PW13. Of those witnesses, only three had their witness statements on oath file along with the petition, while the other 10 were subpoena witnesses whose statements were filed separately after hearing in the petition had commenced. The respondents objected to the competence of the subpoena witnesses if evidence and adopt their addresses and witness statements on oath and reserve the rulings for their objection to the state of final address. That prejudice to the objection that witness says adopted their adopted their respective witnesses statement on oath, after which they were duly cross-examined by all the senior counsel for the respondents. Upon closure of the petitioner's case, the first respondent as well as the second and third respondents called one witness each in their defense. The fourth respondent did not call any witness but opted to rely on the evidence already adduced by the other respondents and that in the state under cross-examination on behalf of the fourth respondent. At the close of evidence, parties filed and extended their respective final addresses, including separate addresses, support of their various objections with the race within trial. So we shall now consider the respondents' objections to the competence of some of the petitioner's witnesses and to the documents tendered by them during trial. To save time, we skip the addresses of counsel, go to the resolutions of those issues. We skip the addresses of counsel, go to the resolutions. The resolution of the respondents' objections to witnesses and documents and then on page 84. The resolution of the respondents' objections. In the first segment of the respondents' objections, all the respondents challenged the competence of PW3, PW4, PW5, PW6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 13. And the respondents' essential contention is that the witness statements on oath whose witnesses, on oath of those witnesses of the petitioners were not promoted along with the petition, but were only filed during trial. Contrary to paragraph 4, the witnesses were not filed along with the petition schedule to the electoral act. Only filed during trial. Section 285.5 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, which limits the time for presidential election petition provides as follows. An election petition shall be filed within 21 days after the date of the declaration of the result of the election. In the same vein, section 132 sub 7 of the electoral act 2022 provides as follows. An election petition shall be filed within 21 days after the date of the declaration of the result of the election. Paragraph 4 of the first schedule to the electoral act 22 stipulates the contents of an election petition which shall be filed. In particular, paragraph 4, 5 of the state schedule mandates as follows. The election petition shall be accompanied by a list of the witnesses that the petitioner intends to call in proof of the petition, b written statements on oath of the witnesses, and c copies or list of every document to be relied on at the time of the petition. In paragraph 6 of that paragraph, a petition which fails to comply with the above requirements shall not be accepted for filing by the secretary. Paragraph 14 sub 2 of the same first schedule of the electoral act then provides as follows. After the expiration of the time limited by a section 132 sub 7 of this act for presentation of the election petition, no amendment shall be made. 
one, introducing any of the requirements of paragraph 401 contained in the original election petition file, or two, effecting substantial alteration of the ground for or the prayer in the election petition, or three, except anything which may be done under subparagraph 2A, uh, Roman 2, affecting a substantial alteration of or addition to statements of facts relied on to support the ground for or sustain the prayer election petition. And uh, sub B, paragraph 12, who filing the reply, no amendment shall be made. One, alleging that the claim of the seat or office by the petitioner is correct or false. Two, and accept anything which may be done under the problem of paragraph 2A, Roman 2, affecting any substantial alteration to, uh, in or addition to the admissions or the denials contained in the original reply file or to the facts set out in the reply. The above quoted uh, provisions of the Constitution, Electoral Act 2022, and the first schedule there too, have been thoroughly considered by the Supreme Court in several cases, including Okean, another Mimi versus, you know, Mimico and others, Wimbi, uh, J.C., Oba, and Vincent, Rarume, and others, Anik, uh, Okuru, Ogi, and others, EDP, and Okuru, and several others listed here. In Oke and Mimico, the upper apex court by Ugumbi J.C. held as follows in the court. By paragraph 4, 1, and 5 of the first schedule to the Electoral Act, the composite analysis of an election petition has been dealt up and spelled out, and also a list of materials which must be accompanied. The use of the word shall in the subsections in very, is very instructive, mandatory, conclusive. In other words, the provisions do not allow for additions, and hence, the procedure adopted by the appellants in seeking for an extension of time is nothing uh, other than a surreptitious attempt to amend the um, uh, petition. This is obvious from the nature and substance of the application, especially where one of the grounds seeks to put in, in facts which are allegedly not available at, which were not allegedly not available at the time of filing the petition, but only came into their position after the statutory time limit allowed for the presentation of election petition. Expressly, there is no provision in the legislation which provides for extension of time. What is more, PDA paragraph 14.2 of the first schedule to the Electoral Act, the appellants by section 134 sub 1 of the Electoral Act have been totally foreclosed from any amendment which was in fact the hidden agenda promoting the application. The saying is true that even the devil does not know a man's intention. It can only be inferred from the act exhibiting that which is conceived in the heart, mind. The use of the word shall in paragraph 14 sub 2a of the first schedule to the electoral act mandatory and places a complete bar in any form of amendment to a petition file does not allow for an exercise of distribution form but amendment to a petition file still does not allow for an exercise of distribution form but amendment critical for result of the application Relief two, six, court, speak to all additional witness to which with AEO. It is pertinent to state that at the close of pleadings, parties have submitted the list of witnesses who were to testify together with their depositions. The idea, the idea, purpose, and intention of the application is suggestive of nothing more, nothing more but a clear confirmation seeking for an order of an amendment as rightly and ingeniously brought out by the trial tribunal and also affirmed by the lower court. This will certainly violate the provision section 285.5 of the Constitution, section 134 of the Electoral Act, laws of court. In his concurring judgment in the same case, Nguta ASC specifically stated follows, a court, the additional or further witness depositions sought to be allowed for a just and fair determination of the petition are uh, fresh facts as found by the tribunal and which finding was endorsed by the lower court. This court will not interfere with the concurrent finding of fact of the two lower courts when the appellants have failed to show a special circumstance for this court to do so. Election petitions are time-bound and the court will not allow 
the party to resort to any sort of subterfuge or to persuade the intention of the elect uh, electoral act that petitions be because of the judiciary. The petitioners in this case have relied on the earlier decisions of this court in Omidiran versus Ete, Lassun versus Awoyemi, Supra, to argue that the subpoena witnesses whose uh, witness statements on oath were filed outside the time limited for the presentation of the petition are competent to testify because that they are subpoena witnesses who do not work for the petitioner. However, it is pertinent to observe that unlike in the present case, the subpoena issued at the instance of petition in the case of Omidran and Ete and Lassun versus Awoyemi were decided under the Electoral Act of 2006, which did not have provisions similar to paragraph 4 sub 5 of the first schedule to the, to the External Electoral Act 2022. Secondly, the subpoenas in the above two cases were issued and served on adversaries, namely the resident electoral commissioners. Again, those two cases were decided before the introduction of section 285 subsection 6 of the 19, uh, uh, Constitution of Federal Parliament Nigeria 1999, which mandates that an election petition shall be decided within 180 days from the date of filing of the petition. Thus, whilst this court in Omidran and Ete and Lassun versus Awoyemi appeared to have adopted a flexible approach, the Apex Court had taken a strict approach in its latter decision in OKK and Mimiko. Indeed, it, in subsequent when the Apex Court's decision in OK and Mimiko, this court, per Ajim JCA, as he then was, now JC, alerted this strict position of the law in Ogba, uh, versus Vincent, at paragraph 46, 48, paragraphs A to B, by him he held as follows, our court. I think that this court in Omidaran and AT and the Supreme Court in OK and Mimiko adopted different approaches in addressing the issue of whether a tribunal or court can allow a witness deposition or other document not filed along with the petition or not filed within the time allowed for, allowed for filing uh, election petition to be filed and used in an election petition proceeding. Omitran's case did not strictly enforce the time limits described in section 141 of the Electoral Act 2006. The provision in the first schedule thereto on prohibiting the introduction of additional facts in the proceedings after the period allowed for filing a petition and closure of pleadings and paragraph one of sub one of the electoral election tribunal and court practice directions of 2006 on the content and form of the petition held that the purpose of the practice direction is to guide and regulate compliance with an observance of the provisions of the first schedule to the act and the federal high court rule where applicable this elastic application of the electoral laws by this court in that case is not in line with the current judicial approach of strict enforcement of electoral laws and the current approach of applying the electoral tribunal and court practice directions as overriding the rules of court in election court cases. In Mimico, sorry, in Okia Mimico, the Supreme Court approached the issue in keeping with the current judicial trend of strictly applying electoral laws and procedural rules and giving them supremacy over rules of court in election cases. The Supreme Court has consistently, in a long line of cases, insisted on this strict and inelastic approach opposing the electoral laws. The law has laid out this team of juries in OK and Mimico is that a witness a position that is not filed along with the petition within the 21 days allowed for filing the petition cannot be filed in the proceedings. It held thus, if there was an evidence which was fundamental to the termination of the petition, that evidence ought to have been placed willy-nilly before the tribunal within the time limit specified by the Electoral Act or any other act. That evidence ought to be regarded as the spinal cord of the petition. Even if it has been withheld by any person, there are several ways to go about placing them before the tribunal. Evidence Act is very clear on this. The petitioners ought to have resorted, uh, restored that procedure, close of court. The firm position of the Supreme Court, as stated in Okia Mimiko and followed by this court in Oba and Vincent Supra, is that 
by the combined provisions of Section 855 of the 1999 Constitution, Section 137, Subsection 7 of the Electoral 2022, and Paragraph 4, 5, and 6 of and 6 and 14, 2 of the first schedule to the act, every written statement on oath of the witness which a party intends to call must be filed along with the petition within the time limited by Section 2855 of the Constitution of Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended, and Section 132, Subsection 7 of the Electoral Act 2022. Once the time limit, um, time limited for filing of a petition has elapsed, the contents of the petition cannot be added to or amended in any manner or under any guise. Any written statement on oath of a witness filed outside that 21 days limitation will amount to a surreptitious amendment of the petition and a breach of paragraph 14 of the first schedule to the electoral uh, of 2022. This is irrespective of whether the witnesses to be called are ordinary or expert witnesses and whether they are willing or subpoena witnesses. Since then, this has been the consistent position of the law followed by this court. Indeed, in Okuru versus Obe, this court takes this position power. Uh, our learned brother Bulaji Yusuf just stated that uh, court. From the records, PW3 and PW4 was summoned by subpoena issued by the tribunal and presented as expert witnesses. The question is whether this is without more entitled the appellant to file their statements on oath outside the time set for filing a petition. Or a reply to the respondent's reply in answer to the petition. I am of the humble view that whether an expert witness or not, a witness remains a witness. So the proviso to Order 3, Rule 3, Sub 1 of the Federal High Court, Civil Procedure Rules 2009 and 9, made applicable to an electoral election petition by Paragraph 54, the first schedule to the Electoral Act, provides that the statements on oath of witnesses requiring subpoena from the court need not be filed at the commencement of the, of the suit. Two, the witnesses who require subpoena or summons shall, at the instance of the party, calling them be served with civil form 1A before the filing of the statements that witness. The application of that rule is with regard to and or subject to the provisions of the electoral act, not independent of the act. Paragraph 54 reads, subject to the express provisions of this act, the practice and procedure of the tribunal or the court in relation to an election petition shall be as nearly as possible, similar to the practice and procedure of the Federal High Court in the exercise of its civil jurisdiction. And the civil procedure rules shall apply with such modifications as may be necessary to render them applicable having regard to the provisions of this act, as if the petitioner and the respondent were respectively the plaintiff and the defendant in an ordinary civil action. The provisions of the electoral are being a substantive law shall override any rule of court which is contrary to provision. The subsidiary legislation must conform with the principal law, the NNPC and AFANFA Oil Limited. The proviso to order 3 rule 3.1 of the Federal High Court Rules 2009 cannot override or affect or whittle down the absolute and mandatory provisions of Section 285 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as uh, 1999 as amended which stipulates that an election petition shall be filed within 21 days after the date of the declaration of the result of the elections, and paragraphs 4, sub 1, 5, and 14, 1, and 2 of the first schedule to the electoral act, which stipulate the content of a petition. It is therefore clear that in law, the provisions of Order 3, Rules 3, 1, of the Federal High Court Civil Procedure Rules 2009, cannot provide a platform for filing and using witness statements on oath not filed within the time limit set for presentation of petition, and which time cannot be extended for any reason under any guise. The focus of our decision in Og uh, Ogba and Vincent Supra was the injustice in allowing a piece of evidence not covered by the pleadings to be presented to the court when the opposing party would have no opportunity to react to it. It is my humble view that the position of law, of the law, as can be cleaned from the section 2855 of the Constitution, paragraph 4, 14, 2, and 16, 1 of the first schedule to the Electoral Act, is that a petitioner cannot be allowed to file 
can use documents or witness statements on oath filed outside the time set for filing petition and to which the respondents would have no opportunity to react. To do so will amount to creating an avenue which a petitioner can use for split to overreach the respondents. That is the stand of the Supreme Court, OK and Mimico, number one Supra, followed by this court, Oba and Vincent Supra, those of court. Again, in Ararumi and another, but and, 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 and Anik and others, in which I read, uh, wrote, wrote the lead uh, judgment, they are stated as follows. The law, therefore, is that the deposition of a witness must accompany the petition at the time of filing the petition. In other words, the written statement on of, 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 of an intended witness must be filed along with the petition. Thus, any written deposition of a witness not filed along with the petition will not be countenanced by the trial by the court or tribunal. Therefore, means that a written deposition filed by a witness not listed in the petition nor his deposition prolonged cannot be countenanced by the court or tribunal after the expiration of the time prescribed for the filing of the petition. I think that is what the trial tribunal decided in this case, lined with the decision in Oba and Vincent. The combined effect of paragraph 4, 5, Roman 1 and 2, 14, 1 and 3 of the first law to the Electoral Act is that no witness can testify in chief before a tribunal if he has not deposed a written statement on oath which must necessarily have been filed along with the petition. Close of court. From the foregoing, the, uh, from the foregoing judicial decisions, it is clear that in election petition litigation, whether the witnesses which a party intends to call are ordinary or expert witnesses, and whether they are willing or unsupreme witnesses, their witness deposition must be filed along with petition before such witnesses will be competent to testify before the tribunal or court. It is instructive to observe that one of the leading senior counsel for the petitioners in this, in this petition, Dr. Onyechi Ipiazu, SAM, was the lead counsel to the second respondent in Ararume and another versus Anik and others wherein he successfully challenged the competence of a subpoena witness, Ama Ibom Abu, EW2, on the same ground that the witness statement on oath of the same witness was filed on 8-7-2019. Long after the time limited for the filing of the petition. Therefore, the petitioners in this case were well aware of the certain legal position on subpoena witnesses in election petitions edited by the Supreme Court and by this court, yet they embarked on subpoenaing PW3, PW4, PW5, PW6, PW7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 13, 10 out of their 13 witnesses whose witness statements on oath were not front-loaded along with the petition. The petitioners have tried to argue that the said witnesses are witnesses of this court. With respect, this argument is misconceived because the subpoena in respect of those witnesses who are issued upon the request of the petitioners. The application for the issuance of the subpoenas were duly signed by the, uh, filed at the registry of this court by the petitioner council and the requisite fees paid, including filing fees and services. Service fees as assessed were duly paid by them before this court approved and issued the subpoenas. Therefore, those witnesses are the petitioner witnesses and not witnesses of this court. Indeed, the procedure for calling of witnesses by the court is by short summons as stipulated in paragraph 42 of one of the first schedule to the Electoral Act 2022. By the provisions of that paragraph, the tribunal or court may summon a witness as a witness who appears to the tribunal or court to have been concerned in the election. Clear from the provisions of that paragraph that is a person summoned by the court so motu in exercise of its powers under paragraph 421 that is a witness of the court and not a person to pin at the request of a party to the case. In the instant case, PW3, who was subpoenaed at the request of the petitioners, is a staff of channels television who tendered exhibits PBH3 and PBH4, two flash drives containing third an consultative meeting with leaders of political parties held on 26 October 2022. 
an interview with Mr. Mr. Festus Okoye, National Annual Commissioner, held on 12 March 2023, respectively. E.W. Four, a professor of mathematics who was engaged before the election by the petitioners, and whom the petitioners presented as a supreme expert witness, stated under cross examination by the first respondent that he concluded his report on the 19th of March 2023 before the petition was filed. PW5 is a staff of Arise Television who also tendered exhibit PCG2, a flash drive showing the INEC chairman delivering an address at the Chatham House, London, UK, on the preparations for the 2023 elections in Nigeria. PW6 is a staff of African Independent Television, AIT, who tendered exhibit PCH1, a flash drive of the program Democracy Day, anchored on 22nd November 2022 wherein the ANIC chairman was shown giving a brief on the preparations for the 2023 direct election. PW7, who claimed to be a cloud engineer, an architect working with Amazon Web Services, Incorporated, tendered exhibits PC, PCJ3A to F, which are six reports of Amazon Web Services AWS Health Dashboard which she said she downloaded from the Amazon website. Under cross-examination, however, she not only admitted that she is a member of the second petitioner. Please, let, let us be serious. This is a serial matter, it's not a last matter. She not only admitted that she is a member of the second petitioner, the Labour Party, but she, she had contested elections as a candidate for the second, of the second petitioner for House of Representatives election conducted along with the present election on 25th February 2023. PWF, who claimed to be a cyber security expert engaged by the Labour Party on 10th March 2023, stated that he produced his preliminary report on 17th or 18th March 2023 before the petition was filed. He tendered exhibit PCK1, a metadata. PW9 is staff of Women and Child Rescue Initiative a non-governmental organization claimed to be an observer in the 25th February 2023 election but stated that the subpoena was addressed to him personally and served at his village address. PW10 claimed to be an annual ad hoc staff who acted as a supervisor. He stated under cross-examination that the subpoena was addressed to him personally and not through INEC. PW11, who is a staff in the Legal Services Department of National Information Technology Department Agency, NIDDA, stated that the subpoena was addressed to him personally instead of his organization. As for PW13, who claimed to have acted as a presiding officer in the 25th February 2023 election, he stated that he was on a subpoena. The subpoena which was admitted as exhibit PCR was, however, addressed to him personally and not through any. It's pertinent to observe that the above 10 witnesses seen by the petitioners were all witnesses who were available to the petitioners at the time of filing the petition. They, they, are, neither, they, they, they were neither subpoenaed as adversaries nor subpoenaed as official witnesses. It is therefore beyond controversy that the witness statements on oath of those witnesses filed after the time limited for presentation of the petition had lapsed are incompetent and the same witnesses had no virus to testify in this petition. Their testimonies are embodied in their respective witness statements on oath, being incompetent are accordingly struck out. With regard to the respondent's objections to the admissibility of documents tendered by the petitioners, the first objection raised by the respondent is, is to exhibits tendered through PW4, as to exhibits tendered through PW4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 8. These are exhibits PCD1, PCD2, PCD3, PCE1, PCE2, PCE3, PCE4, and PF2, gender 3, PW4. Exhibits PCG1 and PCG2, tender 3 through PW5. Exhibit PCH1, tender through PW6. Exhibits PCJ1, PCJ2, PCJ3, A to F, and PCJ4, tender through PW7 and exhibits PCK1 and PCK2 tendered through PW8. These, the said exhibits are, I have, uh, I them in the, in the chart.
that means. The respondents' essential argument is that since the supreme witnesses and their witness statements on oath are, are incompetent, the documents tendered through those witnesses cannot be countenanced by the court. By paragraph 41.3 of the first schedule to the electoral of 2022, oral examination of witnesses is not allowed. Witnesses are only to adopt their respective written depositions and tender in evidence all disputed documents or other exhibits referred to in their depositions. By paragraph 4, 5B of the schedule, that written depositions of the witnesses must be filed along with the petition. Since the above exhibits are documents, including expert reports, which were tendered through the subpoena witnesses, whom we have already declared incompetent because their witness statements on oath were filed in violation of the mandatory provisions of paragraph 45B of the first schedule of the Electoral Act 2022, the documents admitted through them which form part of their evidence are inadmissible and liable to be exchanged from the record. In the case of Buhari and Ainik, the petitioners have also argued that since the parties have agreed during pre-hearing session that documents properly certified by Ainik will not be objected to, and the said documents were tendered from, from the bar pursuant to pre-hearing order of this court of 23rd May 2023, the parties are bound by the order of the court since the same has not been appealed against by the second and third respondents. However, this contention of the petitioners does not represent the position of the law. It is tied that a court is not permitted in any event to admit an act on leg. Uh, it is tied that a court permitted to act in any event to admit an act on legally admiss inadmissible evidence, even if such evidence had been admitted by agreement of the parties or under order of court in the course of hearing. Once such evidence is legally inadmissible, the court must reject it when giving its judge final judgment, even if that will amount to overruling itself by so doing. Ishanu and Afri Bank are UI for JSC. Indeed, even, even in the case of Sani and Akwe, relied upon by the petitioners, this court at paragraph 20, paragraph DPA, restated the position of the law that even when pieces of evidence had been improperly receiving evidence, trial court as well as appellate court have the power to expunge it from the record and decide the case only on legally admissible evidence. On the objection of the respondent to the admissibility of the documents tendered as expert reports by the petitioners, which were admitted as exhibits PCD1, PCD3, PCE1 to PCE4, PCJ2, PCJ3A to F, and PCK1, the respondent's contention is that they are caught up by the provisions of Section 83 of Section 3 of the uh, Evidence Act 2011, having been contrived for the purpose of this petition. It is certain law It is settled law that as provided in section 83, subsection 3 of the Evidence Act 2011 and pronounced upon in several editions of the appellate court that a document which is made by a party interested in a pending or, or anticipated proceeding involving a dispute as to any fact which the document tends to establish is inadmissible in evidence. Thus in Latoja and Ajimobi, where the Supreme Court by Peter Odili, JSC held as follows our court. In respect of what is referred to as a person interested, I shall, I shall refer to the cases of Nigeria Social Insurance Trust versus Cliffco, Nigeria Limited. As regards the phrase, a person interest, I agree with the respondent that the phrase has been examined in the case of Ivan versus Nobel, where a person not interested in the outcome of an action has been described as a person who has no temptation to depart from the truth, one side or the other. A person not swayed by personal interest, but completely detached, judicial, impartial, independent. In other words, it contemplates that the person must be detached, independent, and, and non-participant, and really not interested which way in the context the case goes. Normally, a person who is performing an act in official capacity cannot be a person interested under section 91 of section 3, which is now the section 
I think the phrase, the person interested, Eva Moso has been quite dif uh, definitely put in the case of Halton and Halton. I mean a person who has pecuniary or other material interest in the, in in the result of the proceedings, a person whose interest is affected by the result of the proceedings and therefore would have no temptation to, to avert the truth to serve his personal private ends. It does not mean an interest in the sense of intellectual observation or an interest purely due to sympathy. It means an interest in the legal sense which imposes something to be gained or lost. The uh, CPC and Ombugadu, when consider, is considering and determine who is the person interested under section 913 of the Evidence and Truth and Love Health does, by the provision of section 913, Evidence Act, a person interested is a person who has a pecuniary or other material interest and is affected by the result of the proceeding and therefore will have no. Well, we sincerely apologize for the loss of signal from the ongoing judgment or declaration of judgment of the election, presidential election petition tribunal going on in Abuja. As soon as we are able to get the signal back, we will definitely, you know, hook up. Please stay with us. Don't go anywhere. Three. It's one Abubakar Atiku, People's Democratic Party for the Petitioners, and Independent National Electoral Commission. On Esquire and Miss Huayla Muhammad Ibrahim, we're all here, sirs, for the second respondent. Thank you, sir. Yes, third and fourth. With profound humility to my noble lords, my name is A. A. Malik. My humble appearance, my lords, is for the third and fourth. My many brothers of the Inaba, of Batunde Ogala, SAN, Remy, Dr. Remy Ola Tubura, SAN, and Nuta Lubi Ojo Adebayo, SAN, all appear with me. And together we have a
colleagues appearing with us, namely Emmanuel Uwadoka Esquire, Inka Ajeti Fuja, Ajeni Fuja, sorry, my name. Esquire, Akintola Makinde, Esquire, and Julius. a preliminary report on 17th and 18th of May 2023, and final report, Exhibit PCK1, at the end of May 2023, while this proceeding pending. It is therefore PW4, PW7, and PW8 are persons interested in the outcome of this proceeding. The reports proceed, produced by PW4 and PW8 qualify as statements made by persons interested in, in anticipation or during dependency of this petition. As for PW7, she is, in, she is admittedly an in, interested party, having been a member of an even contested election under the umbrella of the pet, second petitioner. Her interest is further underscored by the fact that she admitted under cross-examination that she was attending court throughout the proceedings prior to her evidence. By virtue of Section 83 sub 3 of the Evidence Act 2011, the report tendered by those witnesses which form part of their evidence are it admissible. The Bluetooth device is ready to pair. The Bluetooth device is connected successfully. The radio motor. PBP1 to PBP21. The IRF report for Adama State on the ground that no certificate of authentication of those computer-generated documents was filed in compliance with Section 84 of the Evidence Act 2011. Exhibit PCD1 to PCD6, referred to by the petitioners in response to the quotation, are IRF Certificates of Compliance for Bayelsa, Benway, Ikiti, Niger, Ogun, and River States. Adamao State is... Adamao State is not included in those exhibits. Exhibit PCC1 to PCC28, which include Adamao State, are actually Beaver's reports and their certificates of compliance. That of Adamao is PCC21. In short, no certificate of compliance was produced by the first respondent in respect of Exhibit PD, PDP1 PDP21. The blood IRF reports exhibit is ECA series in respect of Adamao State. However, since the documents were stated to have been downloaded from Annex IRF portal and were certified by Annex as true copies of what they have in their IRF portal, the documents qualify as public documents within the meaning of Section 102 of the Evidence Act 2011 and the certification by Annex authenticates those documents. Therefore, the provision of Section 84 of the Evidence Act is not applicable case. This is the position of the law as espoused by the Supreme Court in the case of Kubo and Dixon, where the Apex Court held that the computers from internet generated documents printed from the website of a public institution is a public document, only a copy of that document which is duly certified in compliance with section 104 of the evidence of 2011 admissible. That I've started the uh, victim of Supreme Court by a case ASC court. Exhibit PBP1 to PBP21, having been downloaded from ANIC IRF report and duly certified by ANIC, are clearly admissible. As for the fourth respondent's objection to exhibit PCG2, the flash drive ended by PCG2, by PW5, its staff of Arise TV, it is clear that the said witness had in paragraph 6 to 12 of his witness statement on oath not only stated that he participated at, in all stages of the recording, production, and packaging of the flash drive, but he had 
certified the process, process production as required by Section 84 of the Evidence Act. On the fourth respondent's objection to the admissibility of Exhibit X2, on the ground that the Exhibit X2 was obtained by the petitioners from the register of this court and not from the custodian of the original copy, we have examined Exhibit X2, which is the European Union Election Observation Mission Nigeria 2023 final report, as rightly observed by the fourth respondent. The photocopy of the document is satisfied by the Secretary of the Presidential Election Petition Court and not any officer of the Euro uh, European Union Election Observation Mission, which is the custodian of the original copy of the document. By Section 1041 of the Evidence Act 2011, the secondary evidence of any public document is only admissible in evidence if it has been certified by a public officer having custody of the original copy of the document, who by that section may give a copy of them to any person who has a right to inspect together with a certificate written at the foot of such copy that it is a true copy of such document or part of it as the case may be. Under subsection 2 of that section, the public officer is enjoined to certify same by subscribing his name, official title and date and why he is authorized to use a seal with his seal. Clearly, the registrar, the, the registrar of this court, who is not the custodian of the original copy of Exhibit X2, cannot validly certify that document under Section 104 one of the Evidence Act 2011. The Omissary and uh, Arebe Shola, Manuel Vaz Umana, where Mwezi JSC stated that the whole essence of the court's insistence on the scrupulous adherence to the certification requirements of public documents is to watch safe their authenticity vis-à-vis -vis the original copies. Since Exhibit X2 has not been validly certified, is inadmissible in evidence. Finally, X2 is expunged from the record. The third aspect of the petitioner's objection to the petitioner's document is on the ground that the petitioners failed to plead specific facts to cover the documents objected to. The said documents objected to by the respondents are exhibited. So many they have been listed in this judgment. Get the judgment, you will see them. I have carefully examined the petitioner's pleadings and the documents objected to by the respondents. The petitioners have specifically averred in paragraph 101 of the petition that they will be relying on all the first respondents' electoral and all other necessary documents used for the conduct of the presidential election, including the documents which they listed as items A to CCC of that paragraph. However, election petitions are sui generis, and it is certain that for an affirming in an election petition to be competent, material facts relating to complaints made therein must be pleaded. Belgore, Ahmed, Yazu, and Oti. In the latter case of PDP and ANIC, the Supreme Court was categorical on this mandatory requirement of specificity, specificity in affirmance of election petitions when the court held as follows. On whether the affected paragraphs were rightly struck out, I have read the affected paragraph and found that they relate to allegations of non-voting, several polling points, disruption of election, non-conclusion of election, and printing of ballot papers, falsification of election results, widespread disruption, illegalities and malpractice without providing particulars for the polling units where the alleged malpractice took place. The lower court was therefore right when it held as follows. Paragraphs above, in my view, are too generic, vague, and lacking in any particulars, as they are not tied specifically to any particular polling unit or any particular number of people who were alleged to be disqualified. The fact that a party can file further particulars or deny in a reply a vermin in the pleading must not be general, it must be specific as to facts. The certain law that a petitioner's obligation to plead particulars of fraud or falsification without which the allegation, uh, the allegation is a non-starter. I have nothing to add to this statement of law as advanced above. I adopt it as mine. Laws of court. That's where allegations of non-compliance and corrupt practices are made, such as in the instant petition. The polling units, words, 
or other places where those illegalities and malpractice are alleged to have occurred must be specifically pleaded. The petitioners have argued that the issue of non-compliance by defense responders is laws, guidelines, and relevant statutes is a universal complaint because it is an infraction against the Nigerian people and the Nigerian state. However, this contention of the petitioners is not in consonance with the requirement of the law as espoused in Belgore and Amir, PDP and Ani. This is more so as the petitioner's allegations of non-compliance is inter interwoven with allegations of corrupt practice in the same set of facts pleaded both. In the instant case, the petitioner tendered the following documents. which have been listed in this judgment. However, a look at the entire petition shows that no single petition or complaint was made by the petitioners in respect of any of those states as to make those exhibits relevant to the petitioner's case. For instance, in paragraph 72, which the petitioners referred in response to the objection, the petitioners have alleged that there was overvoting in the states of Oyo, Pondo, Taraba, Oshun, Kano, Rivers, Porno, Katsina, Para, Gombe, Yoba, and Najis, Yobe, and Najis states. However, the petitioner failed to specify the polling units where the overvoting took place, the total number of accredited voters, the total number of votes cast, and the number of votes to be deducted from the scores of the parties. Similarly, in paragraph 73, which was also referred to by the petitioners in their response to the objection, the petitioners have Avert that based on the uploaded results, the votes recorded for the second respondent did not comply with the legitimate process for computation of the results and disfavored the petitioners, and listed the states of Rivers, Lagos, Taraba, Benue, Adama, Imo, Bauchi, Paruno, Aduna, Latu, and other states of federation. But the petitioners failed to state the scores improperly computed and how they were disfavored. As regards the objection to exhibits PCA, PCE1, to PCE4, said to be 18,084 and 88 blood results downloaded from IRF and contained in four boxes, the petitioners have contended that the petitioners request for the petitioners to specify the 18,088 polling units with those blood reports left is an impossibility because the results are unreadable. The details of most of the polling units are stated in PCD1 to PCD3, the expert report tendered by PW4. This contention of the petitioners is, however, misconceived. This is because the petitioners who claim that they could not specify the polling units in the 18,088 blood results because those results are unreasonable are the same persons who have stated that the same polling units have been specified in the expert report of PW4 through whom the blood results were tendered. However, PW4 stated under cross-examination that the primary source of the data he used in producing his report was the IRA portal. He did not state how he was able to determine the particular polling units and, and the impacted votes, accredited voters, and the number of PVCs collected. As, we earlier, as I earlier stated, As I earlier noted, PW4's report was concluded on 19th March 2023 before the petitioners filed this petition on 20th March 2023, which means the petitioners were aware of the polling units to which their complaints had led even before they filed the petition. So their theory of impossibility, which they invented around the 18,088 blood, uh, blood results, is misconceived and an obvious misadventure. Again, in paragraphs 7 and 8 of the petition, the petitioners admitted that they have agents in the polling units, and those agents signed and collected duplicate copies of the results sheets. Those paragraphs read as follows. Paragraph 7. The petitioner is a body corporate with perpetual succession and in sponsorship of the first petitioner, and the conduct of the election thereof acted through its members duly appointed as agents at all stages of the election namely at the polling units, 
the ward collection centers, the local government collection centers, the state collection centers, and the ultimate collection center at the federal level in Abuja. Paragraph 8. In the conduct of the election, the agents duly appointed by the petitioners perform their assigned and statutory, statutorily designated roles at the election. Those roles, uh, these roles, included observing and monitoring the process of arrival of election materials where they were supplied by the first respondent and leading to and including the process of accreditation, voting, counting of votes, and announcement of the results of the election. These agents were the election, where the election proceeded in due form upon the first respondent agent duly entering the results in the result sheets at the polling units, signed and collected duplicate copies of the result sheets. Having clearly admitted that their agents signed and collected duplicate copies of the result sheets, their contention that they were un they are unable to determine the polling units from which the blood results the result emanated is untrue. In fact, this admission reinforces the need for the petitioners to specify all the polling units in respect of which they made complaints since their agents were, uh, were availed with copies of the results of the polling units. As regards the petitioners' contention that they have complied with paragraphs 4, 5C and 41A of the first schedule to the Electoral Act 2022, I have I have earlier, I had earlier considered this argument of the petition while resolving the respondent objection to petition pleading, wherein we held that the provision of paragraph 4, 5C of the first schedule <coughs> to the electoral of 2022 only relates to the front loading of documents to be relied upon by the petitioners. As their evidence during trial, it does not obviate the mandatory requirement for pleading materials stated in paragraph 41 1d and 2 and 48 41 8 of the same schedule so as to enable the advanced party to know the exact case he is to meet and to respond to them accordingly as i stated in our <laughs> my earlier ruling the reports with the petitioner stated they had detailed the polling units was not filed along with the petition so as to afford the respondent the opportunity to respond to same, but was merely to send that at trial, by which time the respondents had no opportunity to respond. Since the petitioners have failed to specify in the petition the polling units to which exhibit PCA1, PCA4, the 18,088 blood results relate, the same documents are clearly in addition. That exhibits hereby discountenance and expense from the record. We now go to objection, petition objections to the respondents' documents. In the course of trial, the petitioner also objected to the documents tendered by the first and second, first and second and third respondents at the hearing of the fourth of the fourth of July, 2023. The first respondent had tendered exhibits RA1, RA2, RA3, RA4, RA5, 6, and 7 through his sole witness, Dr. Lawrence. By your day, a deputy director in the ICT department of the first respondent, who gave evidence as RW1. Of those documents, the petitioners had objected to the admissibility of exhibits RA1, RA2, RA6, and RA7. Similarly, at the hearing of the 5th of July 2023, the petitioners had objected to all the documents tendered by the second and third respondent from the bar and through their sole witness. Senator Michael Opeyemi Bamidele, who testified as RW2. The petitioners had reserved their reasons for the objection to be adduced at the stage of final address. Pursuant to the order of this court, the parties should file separate addresses on their objection. The petitioners have filed separate addresses in support of their objections to the documents of the first respondent and those of the second and third respondents. A written address in support of the objection of the first respondent documents was filed on 23rd July 2023, while that of in support of the objection to the second and third response documents was filed on 20th July 2023. In, in the written address in support of the petitioner's objection to the first response document, Dr. Livy Uzoku, Land Senior Counsel for the petitioners, essentially 
raised the sole issue of whether, having regard to the pre-hearing report of 23rd May 2023, paragraph 41 of 3, of the first schedule to Electoral Act 2022 and other relevant provisions of the Act and decided cases, exhibits RA 1, 2, 6, and 7 are inadmissible and liable to be extended from the evidence. Similarly, in the address, the <laughs> respondent document, the petitioners raised the sole issue of whether, having regards to the same pre hearing session report and paragraph 41 3 of the first schedule and decided cases. The documents tendered by the second and third respondents are inadmissible and liable to be expunged from evidence. Plan yourself pointed out that Exhibit RA1 is a private document emanating from the third respondent and argued that in the absence of the narrow exceptions to the maker of the document being the person to tender the document, the witness of the first respondent, that's RW1, cannot tender the same in evidence. He relied on Main Street Bank Limited and General Mills others limited. National Council also submitted that exhibit RA2 is inadmissible because the first respondent cannot appropriate or appropriate at the same time. Since exhibit RA2, the first respondent is trying to deny another letter received by it from the fourth respondent on 15 July 2022, which had, he had also certified. They will just go direct to the resolution. Let's. So by virtue of the provisions of section 102B of the Evidence Act 2011, public documents include public, include public records kept in Nigeria of private documents. And the case of Onwuzureke and Idoziem and others, where the Supreme Court by Onogen JSC held, uh, as it then was, held that a private document sent to the police form part of the record and of the police, and is consequently a public document within the provisions of section 109 of the old evidence act, now section 102 of the Eastern Evidence Act 2011. It's also tried that a public document duly so satisfied is admissible in evidence, notwithstanding that it is not tendered by the maker. Indeed, a certified true copy of a public document can be tendered by a person who is not a party to the case. See the case of Aran Ro and ADBC, Dagash and Bulama, Mustafa, Etima and others versus Al Haji, Ukar of Customs. Exhibits RA1 and RA2, being in the public record of the first respondent, are public documents and are therefore admissible in evidence, having been certified by the first respondent under section 104 of the Evidence Act 2011. On the petitioner objection to exhibits RA6 and RA7, the record of proceedings of this court of 4th July 2023 shows that contrary to the assertion of the petitioners, the said exhibits RA6 and RA7, which are the cloud trail log and certificate of compliance to section 84 of the evidence are respectively, were not tendered from the bar but through RW1. Indeed, the record shows that the petitioners consented to the said documents being taken as read and demonstrated. We therefore have no hesitation in discontinuing the petitioner's objection to those documents. On the whole, the petitioner's objection to exhibits RA1, RA2, RA6, and RA7 tender first respondents and meritorious, it is hereby overruled. Now go to objection to the uh, petition objection to the second and third respondents documents. We consider the The resolution of that objection on the petition objection to exhibits RA8 and RA9, an examination 
of the petition petition shows that in paragraph 28 they have challenged the uh, simple respondent qualification to contest the election on the ground that he was fined the sum of $460,000 for an offense of involving dishonesty, namely narcotics trafficking imposed by the United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, Eastern Division. As rightly submitted by the second and third respondents, they have countered this allegation of the petitioners in paragraph 46 to 53, and particularly pleaded in paragraph 50, that the United States of America, through its embassy in Nigeria, had by a letter dated for February 4, 2003, addressed to the then Inspector General of Police, and confirmed that upon their record checks of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, National Crime Investigation Center, NCIC, a centralized information, tab, information center that maintains records of every criminal arrest and conviction within the United States of America. There were no records of any form of criminal arrest, arrest warrants, or, uh, war warrants or warrants against the second respondent. The respondent shall found and rely upon copy of the said letter of February 4, 2023, signed by Michael done by Michael M. Bonner. Yes. The date is uh, wrongly stated. Corrected. From the foregoing, it is obvious that issues were joined by the parties when the indictment alleged by the petitioners and experts RA 8 and RA 9 are clearly relevant. As for the argument of the petitioner over the custody of the documents, exhibit RA 8 is a letter of inquiry written by by the Inspector General of Police to the, to the Consulate General of the United States Embassy in Nigeria, inquiring as to whether the second respondent had any criminal record in the United States of America, while Exhibit RA9 RA9 is the reply to Exhibit RA8 by the United States Embassy in Nigeria. Both letters form part of the record of the Nigeria Police and are therefore public documents under Section 102B of the Evidence Act. Certification by the Nigeria Police Force that exhibits A8 and RA9 are true copies of those documents which are in their custody. With regard to the petition objection to the relevance of exhibit R10, the record shows that the petition challenge to the qualification of the second responder was confined to allegations of double nomination of his running mate, the third respondent and the alleged fine, of, alleged fine of the second respondent of the sum of $460,000 by a United States court. The educational qualifications of the second respondent were never challenged by the petitioners in this petition. It was the second and third respondents who introduced the educational qualifications of the second respondent in their reply, and the petitioner have not joined issues with the second and third respondents in their reply to the second and third respondent reply that the court of law adjudicates only on matters over which parties are in dispute. The ADDG and Olosho and another the trade bank PLC versus General of Nigeria Limited. Since there is no controversy or dispute between the parties as it relates to the second response to educational qualifications, as with RA10 is not relevant to the termination of this petition, thereby discontinuous. Our examination of exhibits RA11 to RA16, which are data pages and visa pages in the second respondent Nigerian passport, show that contrary to the assertion of the petitioners that the documents are not relevant, the petitioners have alleged in paragraph 28 to 32 of the petition that the second respondent was fined $460,000 for an offense in, involving dishonesty, namely narcotics trafficking, and in response to this allegation, the second and third respondents have denied same in paragraph 46 to 53 of their reply and specifically pleaded those documents in paragraph 52 of their reply to the petition to show that the second respondent enjoyed an unrestricted right of in, uh, ingress and egress to the United States of America. And up till now, he still enjoys an unimpeded right of access to the United States of America. It is therefore our considered view that exhibits RA11 and RA to RA16 are relevant to these proceedings. 
It is an objection to them thereby discountenance. As for exhibits RA17 and RA18, the petitioner's reason for objecting to the same has nothing to do with the admissibility of the documents. The second third respondents having raised objection to the first petition's local standard to present the petition in paragraphs 1 A to M of their reply to the petition. However, we have already considered and determined the issue of the petitioner's local standing whilst resolving the respondent's preliminary objections. We have already res resolved them in favor of the petitioners. Therefore, this objection has been obtaken by our ruling on the preliminary objection. On the petitioner's contention that Exhibit RA19, the report of the committee on the location of the federal capital, territory, uh, federal capital Nigeria, is not relevant. We have examined the pleadings and the said exhibit. It is apparent to us that while the petitioners have averred in paragraph 81 of the petition that a presidential candidate must score 25% of the votes in FCT before he can be declared and return elected, the second and third respondents have averred in paragraph 86 of their reply that the FC FCT does not enjoy a special status over the other states of the Federation and that Abuja is still inhabited by Nigerians who are deemed equal to Nigerians in any other part of Nigeria and residents in, of Abuja are not conferred with any privilege and advantage that is not accorded to citizens other country, uh, communities or states in Nigeria. We are therefore of the view that facts have been pleaded which rendered Exhibit RA19 relevant and admissible. On the petitioner's objection to the admissibility of Exhibit RA22, we observe that the document is the same as Exhibit RA2, which we have already found to be admissible, having been certified by ANIC as a copy of document in their possession. The standard of Exhibit RA22, which is not even certified, is therefore a surplusage, thereby discontinuous. With regard to the objection to admissibility of Exhibits RA24 and RA25, we are which are citizens of pages 28 and 29 and 27 of Nigerian Tribune newspapers, respectively. The reasons advanced for the objection of the petitioners are not legal grounds for challenging admissibility of a document. We have no hesitation in discounting the objection. Contrary to the arguments of the second and third respondents' counsel that exhibit RA27, the equals preliminary declaration is a private document said document forms part of the official record of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, an official body established under the uh, ECOWAS Treaty. An agreement made by member states of the ECOWAS community. And the treaty was signed by heads of states and government of the 16 member states. It's undoubtedly a public document within the meaning of Section 102 of the Evidence Act 2011. However, we observe that Exhibit RA27 is not certified as required by Section 104 of the Evidence Act to render same admissible. Not, uh, not being so certified, Exhibit RA27 is hereby extended from the record. As for the objection to Exhibit RA28 being the American Bar Association membership card of RW2, which was tendered by RW2, under cross-examination by the fourth respondent, it's clear to us that the document was neither pleaded nor listed or referred to in the statement of PW2, right to, uh, RW2, sorry. As rightly argued by the petitioners, Exhibit RA28 is inadmissible. Accordingly, it is a by expunge record. we go to the merit of the petition. Well, having disposed of the various objections to witnesses and to some of the documents tendered in this petition, we now proceed to consider the merit of the petition. The parties filed, exchanged, and objected their, uh, adopted their written, respective written, final written addresses stating, acting with the respondents. The respective final addresses of the first, second, and third, and fourth respondents were filed on the 14th July 2023, respectively. 
On the 23rd of July 2023, 20th July 2023, and 23rd July 2023, if petitioners filed three separate final addresses in response to the final addresses of the first, second, and third, and fourth respondents, respectively. In reaction to the petitioners' final addresses, the first, second, and third and fourth respondents filed their reply addresses on 28th July 2023, and 1st July 2023, and 28th July 2023, respectively. The first respondent and the second and third respondent also filed this of additional authorities on the 28th and 31st of July 2023, respectively. On the 1st of August 2023, the parties adopted their respective final addresses. In the final, uh, in his adoptive final written address, Learning Senior Council for the First Respondent, A.B. Mahmoud, SM, distilled the following five issues for determination. Uh, A. Whether having regard to the problem of Section 131 and 137 of the Constitution of Federal Republic of Nigeria uh, 1999 as amended, and the evidence before the court, the second and third respondents were qualified to contest the presidential election 25th uh, February 2023. B. Having regard to section 47, subsection 2 and 3 of the Electoral Act 2022, paragraph 38 and 92 of the regulations and guidelines for the conduct of the election 2022, the inability of the first respondent to transfer or transmit the results of the presidential election to the IRF portal real time. Amounted to non compliance with the Electoral Act, whether such non-compliance substantially affected the outcome of the election. B. Whether by the totality of evidence adduced, the petitioners have proven that the election of the second respondent was invalid by reason of corrupt practices and non-compliance with the provisions of the Electoral Act 2022. B. Whether in the absence of any proof of lawful and lawful votes to be added to the scores of the petitioners and or unlawful votes to be deducted from the second respondent's scores at the election, the petitioners have proven that the second respondent was not elected by majority of lawful votes cast. B. E, whether having regard to the declared results of the election and the provision of section 134 subsection 2B of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, the second respondent ought to have been returned as duly elected after having scored the highest number of votes cast with 25% of the votes cast in over two-thirds of the state's federation. The learning senior advocate for the second and third respondents, Chief Wale Olani Pekun, formulated the following uh, four issues for the de determination. One, having regard to the relevant provisions of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, salient provisions of the Electoral Act 2022, judgment of the Federal High Court, and FC, FFC, ABJCS 1454 John Labour Party, and ANIC delivered on 23rd January 2023 which is X1, as well as admissible evidence on record, whether the election of the second respondent into the office of president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria on 25 February 2023 was not in com substantial compliance with the principles and the provisions of the Electoral Act 2022. Two, in view of the clear provisions of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999, the Electoral Act 2022, and plethora of judicial precedents on the criteria for qualification of candidates for election to the office of president, coupled with the unreported decision of the Supreme Court in SC Stroke CV Stroke 501 2023, People's Democratic Party was Independent National Electoral Commission, INE, delivered on 26 May 2023, Exhibit RA23, whether the second and third respondents were or are not eminently qualified to contest the presidential election of 25 February 2023. 3. Upon a combined reading of sections 134 and 299, as well as other relevant sections of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, section 66 of the Electoral Act 2022, and other re relevant statutes, whether the second respondent has not satisfied the necessary constitutional and statutory requirements to be declared winner of the present election of 25th February 2023 and returned as President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who, considering the constitution of, constitution of petition and the task evidence adduced, whether this honorable court can accede to 
with the reliefs being claimed by the petitioners. Prince L. O. Fabian Mi Senior Council, Senior Council for the Fourth Responder also nominated four issues for termination as follows. One, whether having regard to the issues joined and the evidence led on the nomination of the third respondent as vice presidential candidate of the second respondent and the annual civil forfeiture of that the alleged civil forfeiture of the sum of $460,000 to the United States by order of the district court in case number 93C0483. The petitioners have established that the second respondent was not qualified to contest the presidential election held on 26 February 2023 as provided for in the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as altered. Two, whether having regard to the relevant and admissible evidence led by the parties, the conduct of the presidential election held on 26 February 2023 election was vitiated by non-compliance that was substantial enough to have affected its outcome and justified notification of the election as envisaged by the applicable provisions of the Electoral Act 2022. Three, whether the burden of proving that first petitioner and not second petitioner scored majority or lawful votes cast in each of the of at least two thirds of all states of the federation and the federal capital territory to be declared and returned as the winner of the presidential election held on 25th February 2023 has been discharged by the petitioners. Four, whether having regard to the totality of the venue led by the parties and the applicable law, the petitioners are entitled to succeed on any of the release sought in the petition at all. Or that the petitioner or that the petition ought to be dismissed in favor of the respondent. On the part of the petitioners, their lead senior counsel, Dr. Levy Uzoku SN, is still the following three issues in the petitioner final address in response to the final address of the first and fourth respondents. One, whether the second and third respondents are qualified to contest the presidential election by reason of the unchallenged facts and circumstances arising under section 137 subsection 1D, 142 subsection 1 and 2 of the 1999 constitution, section 35 of the Electoral Act 2022 in this petition. Two, whether from the documentary evidence before the Honorable Court read and examined together with the unchallenged expert and technical evidence of the petition witnesses, the petitioners proved that the non-compliance by the first respondent with the relevant provision of the Electoral Act 2022 and the subsidiary legislation made there under substantially affected the outcome of the question presidential election held on 25th February 2023. So in response to the second and third respondent final address, the petitioners adopted issues one to three of the issues for damnation with the earlier filed on 18th March, May 2023 during the pre-hearing session. These are, one, whether the second respondent at the time of the presiding election held on 25th day of February 23 was not disqualified to contest the said election by virtue of the provision section 1371D of the Constitution of Federal Republic of Nigeria amended. Two, whether the third respondent at the time of the presidential election held on 25th February 2020 was qualified to contest the said election as the vice president candidate to the second respondent. If answered in the negative, whether this did not invalidate the qualification of the second respondent to contest the said election. Three, whether the present election held on 25th February 2023, wherein the second respondent was declared and returned by the first respondent as the winner, was not invalid by reason of non-compliance with the provisions of the Electoral Act 2022 and any guidelines and regulations for the conduct of the election 2022 made passion to the Act. From the pleadings, the evidence adduced and the submissions of counsel of, uh, of the parties, it is a considered, uh, considered view. That the following are the issues which will effected, effectively determine this petition. One, whether having regard to the provisions of section 137 of the Constitution of Federal Republic of Nigeria 99 as amended, section 35 of the Electoral Act 2022, 
and the evidence at sorry and the evidence before the court the second and third respondents were qualified to contest the presidential election of 26 February 2023. Two, whether having regard to the evidence adduced by the parties, the petitioners have established that there was substantial non-compliance with the provisions of the Electoral Act 2022 and that the non-compliance substantially affected the results of the election. Two, uh, sorry, three, whether from the totality of the evidence adduced, the petitioners have proven that the presidential election held on 25 February 2023 was invalid by reason of corrupt practices. Four, whether from the evidence adduced by, uh, adduced by the, 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 the petitioners have established that the second respondent was not duly elected by a majority of lawful votes as at the election. Well, we stated earlier, we have summarized the submissions of counsel. We did not need to reading them out. The first issue is well, uh, whether having regard guys. to the provisions of section 137 of the Constitution of Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended, section 35 of the Electoral. That's much we are going to take on the live proposal broadcast of the presidential election petition tribunal judgment well, I think going on in Abuja. We want to say thank you uh, for your uh, time and thank you for been in, uh, We hope in, to continue this broadcast after this time out. Please stay with us. So we stand by our resolution.